I'm still here, but at the limit of my mental and physical strength. I want to continue the work this month. I work without interruption, despite the scorching heat of the summer and the unpleasant walk across all of flaming hot Pompeii. The work is unending, every day, for a whole day, every day of the week, in that oppressive house, far away and deserted. Writing during the summer of 1926, Maria Barroso, an accomplished Italian artist, struggled to complete an unusual and challenging assignment by Francis W. Kelsey, professor of Latin at the University of Michigan. Kelsey was a frequent visitor to the famous site of Pompeii in southern Italy. For several years, he had been looking for an artist who could produce a large-scale copy of the celebrated fresco cycle in the so-called Villa of the Mysteries. Kelsey went over and actually looked at the Villa of the Mysteries and looked at the picture, the wall paintings, and felt that they would ultimately fall into disrepair. They were open to the elements, um, the weather wasn't very clement, the sun would beat down on them, the winters would come in, the rains would come in. So he wanted some way to preserve these. So he decided, through his connection with Esther Van Diemen, one of his former students, to contact Maria Barroso and ask her if she would be willing to do life-size watercolors of the pieces. She actually jumped at the chance, and that was the beginning, as they say, of a great friendship. Discovered in May of 1909, the Villa of the Mysteries was located just outside the town of Pompeii and was the country home of a wealthy family. It contained an extraordinary room, known by archaeologists as Room Number 5. Measuring approximately 15 by 21 feet, the room was adorned by a series of brilliant frescoes on all four walls. The meanings of the paintings mystified their discoverers and continue to be debated today. What was the room used for, you know, well, one theory is that it was a big entertainment room and that the dining went on there, so a little thing about Roman dining and um, a sort of, you know, wealthy Romans showing off for their, their friends and neighbors and other powerful people. Barroso seemed like the ideal candidate to undertake the project. Born in Turin, Italy in 1879, she had been trained as an artist at the prestigious Accademia Albertina, where she received her degree with honors. Barroso was no stranger to difficult tasks and understood the unique set of challenges inherent in working with the government. She was, after all, well known within Italian circles as having been the first woman to work at the archaeological excavations in the Roman Forum. Concerned with long-term preservation and interested in obtaining a copy of the wall paintings for teaching, study, and exhibition, Francis Kelsey had skillfully negotiated an agreement with the Italian government. His purpose was to reconstruct a room here in Ann Arbor to share this with uh, the public, with students, with scholars. This was before color photography was uh, feasible. And so although these had been published in black and white, there was no way, unless you went to Italy, and got a special permit to go into this room that you could appreciate what these um, watercolor, what, what these frescoes in, in Pompeii uh, were like. Although Barroso was delighted with the assignment, her letters to Kelsey suggest that she hadn't anticipated how long and arduous the job would be. She worked through blazing hot summers and cold, damp winters. For more than 15 months between 1925 and 1926, Maria Barroso produced 22 large-scale images of watercolor and gouache on heavyweight paper lined with linen or cotton. The largest panel measured 20 feet long and 6 feet high. She copied not only the images themselves, but all of the cracks in the wall plaster and patches of missing paint, striving to produce both a scientific replica and to capture the original aesthetic character of the murals. What's interesting about them is that they are, you know, I think very faithful copies of the Room of the Mysteries in Pompeii, um, but they're also um, absolutely gorgeous watercolors, and her realization and paint of fresco and the damage, they're just certain passages that are absolutely wonderful. 
the, um, the conservators at Pompeii cleaned part of the wall for me so that I could see what the actual color was beyond the grime and the buildup of wax that had been put on the walls over the years. Um, and, and in fact, I discovered that she represented the ancient colors. The murals were completed and ultimately displayed in 1926 at the Galleria Borghese in Rome. The special exhibit opened in November of that year to much fanfare. Prime Minister Benito Mussolini personally sent a senator to represent him at the exhibition. The King, Victor Emmanuel III, visited, as did the Queen and her entourage. This first exhibit was first put up. Mussolini was supposed to come to the exhibit. He was very proud of this, and he saw this as part of a long line of the glories that were Italy and Rome. So he wanted to use this exhibit when it went up in Italy in 1926 at the Galleria Borghese. He wanted to use that as a way of glorifying um, Italy. After the exhibition was over, the Barroso watercolors were shipped to Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1927. Kelsey planned to have them installed in a special room at a museum that he hoped the university would build. Sadly, Kelsey died before any plans could be made. For the next 85 years, Barroso's beautiful works of art sat quietly rolled up in storage, viewed only on rare occasions by scholars and students. A temporary exhibition of the watercolors in the year 2000 at the University of Michigan Museum of Art and the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology brought the pieces to public attention and sparked concern for their current condition. At the time of the exhibition, conservation was minimal, but all 22 images were carefully flattened and affixed to rigid panels with small paper hinges. The six largest paintings were removed from the panels at the conclusion of the exhibit and re-rolled for storage. In 2005, as plans for a new wing of the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology were discussed, it was decided that the watercolors should have a permanent home in the new wing. But exhibiting them posed a new challenge of how best to conserve and display these pieces that, like the fresco cycle at Pompeii, were slowly deteriorating. The 20 and 16 foot segments had been rolled and had been rolled for quite a number of years. So they hadn't really been opened very much. Um, they had a lot of planar distortion. So I think there was one, one panel in particular, once we flattened it out, grew about two inches. The challenge ultimately fell to the experts at the Intermuseum Conservation Association in Cleveland, Ohio, funded by a generous grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services in Washington, D.C. In August 2008, all 22 panels were sent from Ann Arbor to Cleveland for conservation. The images that Maria Barroso was commissioned to reproduce were among the most intriguing discoveries of the early excavations at Pompeii. Thought to have been painted at some time between 60 and 40 BC, the images were widely publicized upon their discovery and hailed as a masterpiece. According to one common but still controversial interpretation, the cycle starts with women first hearing sacred readings and preparing for a ritual meal. Following are glimpses into the world of the god Dionysus. A woman who seems to have wandered into this divine realm appears startled or frightened at the sight of the god, or perhaps by the scenes that follow. These include the possible ritual revelation of a sacred object hidden under a cloth, and a winged woman flagellating a young initiate as a menad dances. The final scenes show a woman dressing her hair for her wedding, while two cupids look on, and across the room, a seated matron who gazes pensively at the bride. There's all the current scholarly debate about what they mean. They're called Villa of the Mysteries partly because they are mysterious to us, but also because they're involved with the mystery of Dionysus. And we think this is, the, one of the interpretations is that it's some sort of initiation or marriage rite for what they call a Dionysiac or a Bacchic cult. But in ancient times, 
no one was allowed to speak about the cult, so we don't have any documentation about what really happened in these cults. The preservation of the original frescoes at Pompeii is due, ironically, to the destructive forces of the infamous volcanic eruption. At approximately midday on August 24, 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius exploded with cataclysmic force, spewing ash, pumice, rock, and dust for more than a day, followed by a river of hot mud and lava that blanketed everything in its path. Two days later, the once bustling Roman town of Pompeii and Herculaneum were silent. Pompeii was covered in more than 15 feet of ash, dust, pumice, and boulders. The depth reached close to 65 feet at Herculaneum. No one knew for sure how many people died in the disaster. One of the few people to witness and survive the catastrophe was the Roman writer Pliny the Younger, who observed the devastation from a safe position across the Bay of Naples at the naval base of Mycenae. Twenty-five years later, Pliny would write his eyewitness account. Broad sheets of fire and leaping flames blazed at several points, their bright glare emphasized by the darkness of the night. Buildings were shaking with violent shocks and seemed to be swaying to and fro as if they were torn from their foundations. You could hear the shrieks of women, the wailing of infants, and the shouting of men. There were some who prayed for death in their terror of dying. Both Pompeii and Herculaneum lay buried and forgotten for nearly 1,700 years, until the chance discovery of Herculaneum in 1709, when workmen digging a well discovered the remains of an ancient theater. Several decades later, excavations commenced at Pompeii, with archaeologists uncovering what is now one of the best preserved and renowned sites of the ancient world. Although the eruption of Vesuvius caused widespread destruction in Pompeii, the volcanic ash also helped preserve much of the area. Archaeologists were astounded by the array of material that was unearthed. Pompeii seemed frozen in time. The town included an aqueduct, amphitheater, gymnasium, swimming pool, several public baths, an impressive plumbing system public toilets, all sorts of businesses and private houses, a town forum, food market, fast food shops, small restaurants, and even a modest hotel for visitors and vacationers. Graffiti was found on the walls. Eighty-one loaves of bread were discovered in the oven of a bakery. Fruit lay on display in glass containers at a market, and a half-eaten meal was discovered on a table. Archaeologists created plaster casts of the victims using an ingenious method. These casts provided a tragic glimpse of life in its final moments. Since their discovery just over a hundred years ago, the wall paintings in Room 5 raised questions about how best to preserve them and faithfully record them for posterity. The volcanic fallout and scorching heat of the eruption in 79 AD caused initial damage, as did a violent earthquake at the site 17 years earlier in 62 AD. Burial in the humid soil for 1700 years caused even more damage to the fragile painted plaster. Nitric salts from the ground leached into the plaster and created disfiguring white patches on the vivid images. Early conservation attempts followed a popular practice of covering plaster surfaces with a mixture of benzene and wax to preserve and polish the ancient pigments. It is now known that this treatment can be detrimental. The wax ultimately produces a hard shiny surface that darkens over time, collects dust, and thereby changes the visual quality of the original paintings. Despite efforts by conservators in the early 1900s, the frescoes continued to deteriorate. In 1931, more than two decades after their discovery, the first attempt was made to fully document their true appearance by color photographs 
and preserve an accurate record of what they looked like. Amadeo Maiuri, an Italian archaeologist, produced a lavish, limited edition, two-volume publication of the frescoes. The second volume contained 18 detailed color plates made with a revolutionary trichrome technique. These striking photographs remain a source of important information even today. As watercolors and an artist's interpretation, Barroso's efforts were of a different and more intimate nature from the Mayuri photographs. She was aiming to produce a scientific copy, as well as recover the original beauty of the paintings. Her lengthy study in the long days locked in room 5 produced an unprecedented knowledge of the paintings. By attempting to reproduce the images as faithfully as possible, she was forced to pay close attention to the original brush strokes, the choice of colors, and other issues that must have concerned the original artist. The conservation of her work would demand the same attention to detail by the team from Cleveland. The ICA mandate was clear to treat the current condition problems, ensure the long-term preservation of the watercolors by mounting them appropriately on a permanent rigid support, and provide increased access while ensuring the safekeeping of these fragile works of art. Treatment and mounting of the watercolors were conducted in Cleveland, Ohio at the Intermuseum Conservation Association Laboratories. Included were unrolling of the six rolled paintings, removal of the 16 currently mounted watercolors from their rigid supports, removal of old hinges, tear repair, reattachment of the watercolor paper to the original lining where needed, filling and in-painting of loss areas in the support if required, gentle humidification and pressing of the watercolors, and mounting of all the watercolors onto aluminum honeycomb panels. The aluminum panels were buffered using acid-free board, and the paintings were mounted using toned, continuous Japanese paper edge hinges. The mounting method has been used extensively for oversized works of art on paper and canvas, and is a reliable method that has proven to be efficient, structurally stable, and lightweight. In September 2009, the conserved frescoes were mounted in their permanent home at the Kelsey Museum in Ann Arbor, a lasting treasure to be studied and admired for generations to come. I think this is going to be one of the centerpieces of the new museum. They are visually spectacular. If you walk into the room, there's no way you can't be absolutely overwhelmed by the beauty of these, of these images. So I think it's really one of the greatest pieces we have, even though it's not a piece of antiquity. It is a record of antiquity. And I think it's something that scholars from all over the world will be interested in seeing, but also just for the public. I think everyone from the ages of you know, eight or 10 years old all the way on up to senior citizens would come in and say, this is pretty spectacular. And it transports you back to the ancient world in a way that we don't have a time machine, but this gives you a sense. What, did it, what was it like to walk in to a Roman villa um, in early Roman times to go there and say, this is the kind of environment that these people lived in. So I think it's going to be a very significant piece of our display. Probably one of the most interesting and most talked about, I would imagine, in the future. Really, it sounds kind of corny, but it really is the realization of a dream for these paintings and also for, the, for Kelsey. For us, though, I, I'm really just so happy that they've been conserved well. Because, you know, for us as, as conservators, even though we're not paper or paintings conservators, we appreciate the difficulties involved. And so to see them finally in their final resting place, so to speak, and to have them uh, securely attached to the wall, to have them, uh, the, the backings, are, the panels are exactly what we wanted. They hold the weight of these pieces, they're hinged properly. I mean, they're just really well conserved. I'm uh, looking forward to the the way the public will react, because it is a pretty stunning 
set of paintings, you know. I think this will have sort of global impact. I think you'll have scholars from elsewhere who will want to come. I think you'll have the universities always finding ways to trot out their beauties, their jewels, and I think this will be one of the jewels that they will definitely trot out. So I think it's going to make a, a big splash and a big impact. I mean, the, the wing in itself will be important, but I think this is the jewel in the crown of the new Kelsey.